you sure you don't want to screen my answers? <laughs> Actually, no, it doesn't. Sometimes I have some great, <laughs> some, <laughs> some answers that <laughs> might not be kosher. <laughs> no, you speak your heart. So, I'm a realist, okay? I'm a documentarian. Okay. But the thing is, I'm an honest one. So hey, you'll maybe, always, you get that. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you tell it like it is. So, well, you know, let's just talk a little bit. Um, Good. I've met you one time, uh, that's when we were shooting the music video, and I remember we were in the club, and uh, we were shoot that was our last scene that we were shooting, lots of people around, and I re remember when you and your wife walked up, um, you guys just had this class about you, you had this black jacket on, you had a cane with you, and it's <laughs> like, I want to say there was like a crystal on the top of it or something, I don't remember, but it was classy. Yeah. <laughs> It was an African cane. It was, uh, my wife brought that thing back from South Africa. Uh, somebody knocked it over and broke the, the handle on it, and I kind of got it in retirement right now until I can get it fixed. Right. But it's a great cane. Yeah. You know, it had a big lion head on it and two elephants. And it was a real, real deal. Well, the thing is, it's like, when you two walked in, and Jay introduced me to you, um, you know, you don't find in the hip-hop community a lot um, a father who sang blues in his time who supports his son becoming a rapper. You know, it's Jay has a very different story than most people. And when he introduced me to the two of you, there was just something very interesting about the two of you. I was like, it's just an interesting I wanted to know more about you, so okay. wh wh where were you born? Um, well, let's see. I was born in a little town called Sidon, Mississippi. Not in the town, in the community. Rural route. Uh, that's down in the Dell Flatlands of Mississippi, in the, about seven miles south of Greenwood, for anybody who wants to know where that is. Um, Greenwood, Mississippi. Um, I moved to Belzoni when I was, guess I was about, oh, maybe 10 or 11, um, which I to always told my dad that was the best thing he ever did for me was to move me off the plantation and move me into the small town because I was not a farmer by any stretch of the imagination. Was not going to be a farmer. But that's pretty much where I'm from. And the little town where I'm from, where I say I'm from right now, uh, the hometown I always use is Belzoni, is known as catfish capital of the United States. And that's why I was teasing about having catfish tonight when I said I had catfish that was so good I thought it came from Belzoni. Because we grow more farm-raised catfish in that little town, in that county, Humphreys County, than anywhere else in the United States. So that's kind of where I'm from. When you were a kid and you say, you know, I, I was not going to be a farmer, um, how old were you when you were thinking about that? Uh, well, in my teens, you know. Uh, in my teens, you know, you're getting up into high school and stuff like that, and you, you're looking around at, at your community and everybody there who's there uh, either is a farmer or does day labor on the farm. And uh, I made it a point at age 15 to save enough money from farm labor to buy a bus ticket to Chicago, which is, and then got a job, 15, worked all summer, and uh, I would never spend that bus fare. <laughs> when I come back, bring a little change home, I would never spend that bus fare back to Chicago next summer because I didn't want to go to the field. I didn't want to chop any cotton. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. So school's out. I catch the next thing, going back to Chicago, get a job, work in the laundry. One summer I worked at Camel Soup Company. But I, I'd find a job, something that paid more than I was going to make if I work, work, worked in the farms at Mississippi because at that day and time, the uh, uh, the day labor was like two fifty, two dollars and fifty cent, or three dollars a day for ten hours. <laughs> yeah, 
Hey, that's rough, man. But that's what it was. And wow. I, I could go to Chicago and probably work for a dollar thirty-five, a dollar fifty an hour, which was. Yeah. Didn't have to pay any rent. Live with my older brother. So we. I'd stash enough money to spin off during the years and going to school and then save that twenty dollars so I can get back to Chicago. Why Chicago? Well, that's where I had I had two older I had a older brother that lived there and, a, and an older sister that lived there. So that's a place I could go and and shack up free, make the little change I was gonna make and didn't have to do anything but feed myself. So that's kind of what I did. When did music enter into your life? When did, I mean, uh, well, like, let's talk about from the time you started going to Chicago to, um, how did that just come about? Like we were listening earlier to, you know, some of your music, which is amazing. <laughs> and just something that is so different from what mine and Jay's generation do right now. Um, what, how the music? Yeah. How well, the music for all of us basically started in church. See, I had uh, four older brothers. And, of course, mom and dad being devout Christians, we all grew up singing in church. So when I was as far back, I guess when I was five, six years old, my older brothers had what they would call a, a quartet. We sang gospel music. Oh, the four brothers. And of course, this is what we entertain ourselves with. At night, we'd sit around the house, and sit around the fireplace at night, and sit on the front porch in the summer, and we'd sing. And uh, my dad had an old ragged guitar, but we never kept strings for it, so it never had more than two or three strings on it. And then my older brothers made one of these things we called a uh, a wall string guitar, which is a one string guitar made from the steel wire from a broom with a nail at the top and, and a couple of snuff bottles, <laughs> a small one at the top and a large one at the bottom. And they tighten up the cord so that you could pick a tune on it. And then they, they'd use what they call a a Dr. Tishner's antiseptic bottle as a bar that once you pick it, you could place the, the bottle on there and you get a different tune as you do the frets on a guitar. So, and they would play, they'd play a few tunes on it. You know, so, so music was always there, whether it was singing or whatever else, you know. And my dad was a, uh, my dad could sing. I mean, he could he could bellow out some blues, see. And uh, but I think he stopped singing because uh, <laughs> I got I got a whipping about imitating him, see. And it came at a time when uh, in the old days you had uh, revivals, church revivals, and all the young children who. Uh, who were not already, hadn't joined the church or hadn't confessed religion or whatever else, we'd go to the revivals and we'd have to be on the, what they call the mourner's bench. And the older people would pray for us and for guidance and whatever else. And we'd have to kneel down and pray and this kind of thing. So I was supposed to be on this mourner's bench and, and uh, <laughs> during the day I had a, <laughs> Nature called up on me, so I went to that little outhouse that we had, and I was in that little outhouse, and I was singing one of Arthur Big Boy Cutter songs, and my mom snatched that door open with a swip, switch, and she just kind of tightened me up real good <laughs> about singing the blues while I was supposed to have been praying. And then when Daddy came home, she told him, you the cause of that, because you always singing these reels. That's what she called it. She said blues. You always singing these reels, and these kids are growing up trying to sing the same stuff you singing. So he kind of stopped. But 
Well, he didn't quite stop because from then on, he would never sing a complete song, but he would belt out a line, and then he might walk 20 yards, and then he'd belt out the second line. <laughs> and so because you got that with him, he stopped singing? <laughs> yeah, he stopped, stopped singing stuff around the house, you know? You know. What, what appealed to you about the blues that your father sang? Uh, as, a, as opposed to, you know, gospel, which, I mean, there's wonderful music. I grew up in church, too. I'm a Christian. and But what was it when you would hear your, your father sing? Well, I mean, he just, he, he sounded, he would sound as good as the, as the guys who would listen to on those 78 records, you know. And, uh, you know, he'd come down to come down the road driving a, a mule team or a horse team or whatever it is. He'd been hauling in a wagon and trotting along in the evening at sundown and, you know, passed by everybody's house and, and the people could hear him singing. They'd holler, sing on, Lee. <laughs> so that's what he would do, you know. You know what I'm saying? You can hear the, the muse of the horse trotting and, and the chains rattling and him singing. You know? I don't know. To the rattle and to the beat and to the rattle. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the way it was. I don't know. We, I guess we all, we all say that we could sing, even though a couple of us couldn't. You know? You can. <laughs> But uh, a couple of us, we, we could always get the words out, but it didn't always sound good. I'm not going to say which ones couldn't carry. <laughs> but if you knew the family, you, you'd be able to, to determine who could who could not. Yeah. When, when did you record your first album? Uh, I recorded my first, not an album. I made about eight single recordings. But I never did an album because I never stayed with any company long enough. I think I did the first one in, in 1969, I guess, something like that, 1969. Um, on uh, Atco Label, which was a subsidiary of Atlantic. And, uh, you know, nobody would give you a, well, you couldn't get a break in the business because you didn't, I wouldn't do a long-term contract with anybody. You know, I, I always said, i give you a year or two years and, and a year's option. And companies weren't interested in that. You know, they wanted contracts that said eight, 10 years, and then they could uh, I, I say they could abuse you for seven of the ten years and take all your money because they wanted, the, most of them wanted all kinds of rights, booking rights, management rights, da da da, this kind of stuff, you know. Typical entertainment industry. Right. But uh, I just happened to be the guy who, who had, uh, had gone to college and had finished and had been to the army and had a job, you know. So I wasn't starving, I wasn't hungry, and I had a profession. So if I could get a, a deal to, you know, that could, was beneficial, I would take it. In other words, I'd just go in and We'd cut a record and spend the money to cut it, and, and we'd shop it to somebody, see if we could get it uh, published, put out there, whatever. And that's kind of the way it was. Basically, in other words, kind of sort of what you're saying is that, you know, the vibe that you were getting, I guess, is what you're saying is that with, you know, some of these labels, they're looking for people who are very talented, but at the same time are so desperate that they will yeah. basically whore themselves out. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, so desperate that they will do whatever they're told, and you you were not going to walk that line. No, never could do that. Couldn't do that. Not can't do it today. No. Yeah. 
Uh, this is something I don't like to do in an interview, but if you can repeat that, um, t- you know, so that, because I'm going to be cut out of it, um, just repeat, you know, no, you can't whore yourself today to the, you know, labels or whatever, or however you want to phrase it. Well, I, I've just never been the kind of, i never been the kind of person that could just surrender myself to anybody else. Totally. I just can't do that. You know, I still have to have a little bit of Nathaniel in there. Uh, even when I go to work, uh, when I work as, as a school administrator or whatever else, you know, I've always said to the guy who interviews me for a job and whatever, I, I have to have the opportunity to disagree, okay? Now, I don't say that in a negative way, I mean, because I do have ideas and I have, I do have a brain, okay? So I think I'd have, I need to use it, and I think it has merit. Uh, and I approach a job like this, you know, I would like the opportunity if something happens that I need to have an opinion about, I want to express that opinion uh, with the understanding that whoever is the supervisor or the CEO or whatever it is, after I have had my opinion, I can take your directions and I can follow them. But at least let me tell you what I'm thinking. And a lot of times, my thinking has been as better than theirs. You know, so I just kind of have to have that. And uh, when it came to the music thing, I was not going to sit back and let some company make millions of dollars off me while I fight my way around the Chitlin circuit and uh, for 10 or 12 years, you know, or until I can get established as an artist and then get the second 10 years with a good, decent contract. No, I wasn't going to do that. I mean, if I, if I had something on, on the ball, if I could have, if I was good enough, and if anybody spent enough money to promote the stuff that I was trying to do, I probably could have made it pretty decently. But nobody was going to spend the money to promote me on a one or two year contract. They just wouldn't do it. So basically, you was this after college you had decided? Oh, yeah. You, you, after college. After college, you had decided that. Um, I want to record some music, and you just went into a studio and just started recording. Well, it wasn't quite like that. Yeah, because that's <laughs> yeah, it, it was. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to it out. was kind of like that, and it was. It was, and it wasn't. Where did it you see start? what happens here? Is I got out of when I went to college. I went. I chose my college based on the fact that Mississippi Valley State had a 17-piece stage band. Okay, and I went there to sing with that stage band. Okay, and uh, and I did for a year and a half, and then the director left, and they kind of cut the jazz band program. And uh, the next guy came in was strictly marching band and didn't care about the other music, so. And I played football. <laughs> well, I played football anyway. But I relied on the, on the uh, athletic scholarship for the next two years. Well, my senior year, I got a, a full ride for choir because I wound up doing an opera that nobody else could do for but I wouldn't put in a rehearsal time unless the president gave me a full ride for the next year. So he gave me a full ride, I did the thing. So music has always been there, you know, but uh, we did the opera La Traviata, you know, pretty good for a small black college in the middle of the cotton field, you know, wasn't bad. Um, But how I got into this, so this uh, recording thing again was, 
when I got out of service, uh, because I love the music, I uh, was living about a mile and a half, about a mile or so from, mile and a half, maybe two miles from the college campus where I graduated from. And I knew some kids on the campus who had a little gig band. So I'm teaching in a local county high school. I hired the little band to play for a school function. And they played well, you know. And uh, I asked them, I said, well, you guys, uh, you play well enough, you should be getting all these high school dances and, and junior college and college dances for coming up in the spring. And they said, well, if you know how to get them, if you get them for us, we'll play them and we'll give you a cut. Well, you know, I've always been, I like a cut or something. <laughs> so, you, you and I both. <laughs> so uh, after a while, they couldn't get any gigs, you know. They didn't get any, so I spoke to them again. They said, well, hey, well, why don't you get us some? You know, we'll play them. And I said, okay, I'll show you how. You know, because that's what I did years ago when I was a student there. And uh, so I got them like about uh, 16 high school and junior college dancers to play between uh, January and, and May. So... Keep going. So after, after I did that, uh, uh, for that year, they started off the next year, and they asked me to assist them again. Well, it was kind of uh, draft time for a lot of young folks, but I guess the, the, uh, uh, the Vietnam, Vietnamese war and all that stuff was beginning to flare up a little bit. So a lot of kids were getting drafted. The singer for the band got drafted and they didn't have a singer. So I said, well, I had been on a couple of gigs with them and because they were playing pretty good, I'd sing a couple of times. So they said, well, hey, you need to come help us out, do a little singing. So I finally wound up and said, I'll sing with you till you find somebody. And they never found anybody. So I wound up now booking the band and doing the singing. So the guy who ran the band uh, was abusing the youngsters because he was half paying them. He was making money and he was paying me well, but he, you know, the college kids were getting peanuts. They, figured, they finally figured out how much the gigs were worth and they kind of got teed off about it. And, uh, they wouldn't work for him, but I had all these contracts out there that I <laughs> had booked them for, so I kind of had wound up taking over the band, so it became my band. What was the name of it? Uh, Nate Allen and the Soul Crusaders. Before that, it was a group called the Isle of Turks, and uh, so it became Nate Allen and the Soul Crusaders. And uh, after, a couple, after, after a couple of years of just playing local gigs in and out of Mississippi, sometimes Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, we're here and there, uh, I became interested in trying to record. Uh, my sister and I was, well, my sister, who was the blues singer, uh, Denise LaSalle, of course, uh, she was trying to get off the ground too at the same time. So I think I had my first single recording, something like 69, maybe 69, whatever. And she got her first, uh, she, she cut this record, I think in 69 or 70, but it didn't break big until a year or so later. Her first million seller record, you know, but but that's kind of how we got into it. Did you ever? Did you? Did you and Denise? Uh, Jay was uh, telling me about her the uh, last night before last. Um, 
Did you and Denise ever uh, merge your talents together and perform together? Uh, not together, but I think in 1973, after I gave up the Mississippi thing and had gone to Michigan, um, I think the summer of 72 or 70, 72, summer 72, um, I did opening for her for the entire summer. Uh, she had gone big and was demanding decent money. And so during the summer after I was, when school was out, I would uh, go over to Chicago and hang out with her and travel with her and, and do the opening acts for her. But in terms of us singing on stage together, no, we never. As a duo or something like that, no. Here's something that's not in my notes, but, um, <clears throat> you know, just listening to you and, uh, my father is 67 years old and, uh, he just wrote a book called Sanctified, which, um, revolves around the story of a judge who, uh, it takes place in the old Appala Appalachian South during the days of the Klan. And it's a story of a judge who loves his people on the mountain, probably mm -hmm. said, takes place somewhere in the Carolinas. Um, and uh, among the Cherokee, the blacks, and the whites. And when a horrendous act of evil is committed against a young black lady mu musician, everybody knows who did it. I mean, it's just one of those things you just know, and the judge knows. But there's not enough evidence to convict the guy. And so the tagline is, what does a judge do when the law doesn't work? And when I, you know, when I read this book, the thing is, my grandfather fought in World War I. Not, not to one, and you know, Dad was. Um, they were friends with a lot of the people who were oppressed during that time. Um, did you ever, in your music and what you guys did, face any sort of, I guess, persecution, so to say, from the whites? Not a well. I say, uh, <laughs> that's kind of funny because. Uh, uh, I had, I'm sure I had the first integrated band in Mississippi. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think somewhere like about in the 60s, 69, 70, uh, uh, there was a, a trumpet player named Terry. I can't remember his last name now, from Kosciuszko, but he could play. And, uh, Terry and, uh, and a drummer from Greenwood, Mississippi, by the name, last name Maloof. Uh, I think it's my first, first name, Scotty, I believe. But the Maloof family <laughs> in my, I, are the same family of the Maloofs that runs Las Vegas. That's the big thing. They're the same folks. Uh, but they ran, they ran the uh, entertainment industry such as jukebox for three or four counties, uh, pinball machines, cigarette machines, they ran all that stuff. Plus, they had a black market liquor warehouse, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and uh, so this guy, he could play drums, but there was no white gigs, no white bands around that was playing any music that they wanted to play. So they first started just coming up on our sets, you know, and asking to sit in. And uh, so they'd just show up, and I said, well. And th then I lost the drummer, so I asked the drummer, if he's coming on anyway, why don't you just play the set, and I'll pay you. So he did. So then Terry says, well, I'm coming. And I said, okay, so I'll pay you too. So I had these guys play. Now, after the word got around, uh, we would get picked on by local police officers when we, when we finished the gig. They wouldn't come in and tell us, you know, we didn't go to the gig in the same, I went in my, my van and I took the band with me in my van, okay? But they came in the car by themselves, okay? So they would wound up getting tickets after the gig because they were 
playing with a black band. And, uh, and we got confronted by local police officers and said that, you know, if we didn't kind of conform to, conform to the standards of keeping blacks with blacks, you know, that, that uh, we weren't going to be welcome in the county. You know. So we tried to find a gig in another county, you know, that kind of stuff. But other than that, you know, uh, it actually got pretty bad. And, and because Terry lived in a little town called Kosciuszko, and uh, we had played Jackson, Mississippi one night. And when he got home that night, he found the crosses burning on his lawn. And his wife was scared to death. And, uh, and she said she was going to leave him. And I said, well, you can't give up a wife for, you know, a $50 gig a night. You know, you can't do that. So if you won't quit, I guess I'll have to just fire you and tell you, because I'm not going to be the cause of your, you know, you breaking up your wife leaving you. I'm not going to do that. So well, he was adamant that he wasn't going to let anybody dictate how he was going to live his life. And blah, blah, blah. I said, well, you're probably not, but I'm not going to hire you. I'm not going to let you on my band say it anymore because I'm not going to be responsible for your wife leaving. I won't accept that. So but that, you know, but that's about the only thing we ever had. Wow. You know, you've, you've seen a lot of, I'm only 33 years old. Jay, how old are you? 31. 31. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a year And, uh, you know, if God willing, we live to be, you're in your 70s? Yeah, 76. 76. Still looking healthy. I'm looking healthy. I don't know how healthy I am, but I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> you look great. And, uh, you know, um, you know, we're early 30s. We're still young pups. I still feel young. Jay probably still feels young. And, you are. Yeah. And we just haven't seen as much change in the world as you have seen change as as cultures move forward in time and transformations take oh, of course process, not. you know. Um, I mean, like, honestly, I wonder if I'm going to be seeing flying cars when I'm 76. You know, if I look You decent. probably will. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we see... I saw a hologram of Tupac on a stage one time, and he looks like a real person up there. Blew everybody's mind. <laughs> I mean, just the things that we see now and how quick things advance. Yeah. And th that's something that I kind of want to ask about, kind of... From your point of view, um, I don't, even though I'm kind of sort of working as a personal producer for him at this point, I still don't quite understand where rap started. So we go from you as a blue singer to Jay as an R&B rap hip hop artist. Um, it's like, what's it like to see such a change in the music that you knew at that time to what it is today? <laughs> I mean, because it comes from somewhere and it develops, and we have no idea what it's going to be 50 years down the road. I mean, what is it like to see that transformation? It's horrible. <laughs> and, and I think he knows that I don't really love rap. <laughs> uh, but, and I don't know where it came from, except there was some kids who started rhyming and it's like the breakdancing. The rap and breakdancing came along right about the same time, and, and it was just kids standing on the corner making rhymes, you know, and patting on their hips and making noise with their mouth. <laughs> that kind of stuff, whatever it was. And it caught on, you know. And uh, it seemed to me that. Uh, they couldn't get anybody to publish this stuff, you know, so some of the guys began to sell it out the trunks of their car. And they put a lot of bad language with a lot of it, which meant that they couldn't get it played. And well, like that first thing with the True Lie Crew, I guess it was the first group that went completely berserk with the, the, the covers of the album and the profanity that they used in it, something like that. And then it just, because it was a kind of rebellious type thing, I guess it just caught on. And, uh, you know, for me, I'm still the, 
uh, the eight bar, twelve bar, sixteen bar blues band, you know, or the good jazz beat of the American standards, which I love dearly, you know. Uh, but uh, Jay's a, he's he's of a different breed, you know. Well, actually, he's of a very different time. Yeah. Different, different time. time. Yeah. But also. You kind of hit the nail on the head on something when you said he's of a different breed. Um, see, because I listen to it a lot, and Jay has always been what he does has always been fascinating to me. Um, notice I said what he does. I'm not saying mm-hmm. what rappers do. What he does, and he's of a different breed in the rap world. There's not a lot of people like him. Um, you know, we we were talking. There's only one other major hip hop artist um, that uh, came out of Nashville, and uh, that that's Young Buck. Um, I really think that Jay is very likely to be number two. If I did not think that, I would not be doing this right now. I'm not getting paid to do this. I'm doing this because I really think that's going to happen. Also, he's one of my best friends too. Okay. Um, He's different than a lot, a lot of rap artists, and you know we were talking the other night that, you know, he said, you know, I, I like a lot of Young Buck stuff, but the thing is, he said all that he talks about are the streets because that's all he knows. He said I have so much more to share and so much more to talk about, and you know, you're one of his biggest heroes, and I love in his song especially "Cut It Out" how he takes that hold on. Keep, you know, mm-hmm. and integrates that and then leads from you as his father into him in this generation. And you still have a very big influence on him. And he's just of a very, very different kind in that sense. I mean, t- tell me just kind of what you see as a father, as him as a separate person from so much of the rest of the world. Well, let's see. I have a hard time understanding why he believes that he's going to make it as a rap, as a hip hop artist. Okay? Now, here's why I say this all of his childhood. We couldn't get him to sing or do anything of the sort. We had to threaten him to get him to get in the church children's choir once. (laughs) Uh, He put the saxophone down that I bought him so he could play baseball and whatever else. And I didn't argue about that. and then he went to basketball, and I wouldn't let him play football until he at least completed his 85% of his lineal bone growth. And by the time he completed it, he figured he was too far behind the other football players that he, you know, they were too far advanced over him, so he wouldn't play. But he was a good basketball player, so he went that route. And through college and whatever else, and he was a pretty good athlete, you know. Went to Europe, played a couple of years in Europe. Uh, but then after that, we get to Nashville, and all of a sudden, he's going to be a rapper. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out, where did this come from? <laughs> And uh, he's put a lot of time in it, and uh, and I, I, only thing I can do is support him, I guess, you know, if that's where he wants to go. But uh, I just couldn't quite, I still haven't quite figured out how he arrived at that thing, you know, that this is what I'm going to do. Uh, because it's, uh, entertainment is a tough, is a tough piece. Now, of course, his mother says that I breeded this into him and his sister, that they are my little clones and they got uh, entertainment 
embedded in their DNA somewhere. And I said, well, you know, I always wanted to do that, but at the same time, I had to make sure that everybody was fed first. And if it didn't, if it got in the way of feeding people and being responsible, I let it alone. See, I put it down from, from 1973 until I've retired. 2002, 2003, I may decide I was going to do that, do an album, just to see if I still had anything. Yeah. But I don't know. Uh, uh, I would like. I mean, there is there are plenty of things out there that you can rap about. There are plenty of uh, life stories out there that's worthy. Uh, I just would like him to be a, a person that communicates ideas and stuff as opposed to uh, the, 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 the street language that I hear in a lot of other rap artists. You know, I, that's why I want to work with them. I mean, yeah. it's a good, I mean, I, I listened to his music, what I was listening to, this is the first time I ever heard some of your stuff. I love your stuff too, man. I, I really do. Thank and, you. Um, it's a, it's touching. And, where did you, where did you guys live when Jay was born? Where did I do what? Where did you live when Jay was born? Uh, Muskegon, Michigan. Yeah. I lived yeah. in Adrian, Michigan at one point. Okay. I, I don't know how close that is to Muskegon. Well, I can't really tell you where Adrian is right now, but we are on Lake Michigan. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So right across from, from, uh, from Grand Rapids, about 40 miles west, and we are at the lake, uh, just north of Grand, what is it called? Grand Haven? I was about an hour and a half south of Detroit, so it's basically right across the Toledo. Adrian, area. okay, yeah, I know, I remember. I remember. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what took you up to Michigan? Uh, I was married to a woman at the time who was uh, had a grant to study for a PhD, and uh, I was. In Mississippi, we were in Mississippi, and uh, I had just taken a year off to finish a master's degree, and uh, and made and making a living with the gig band at the time, but did a master's degree, and uh, so I resigned from the school system. And by the time I finished my master's, she had a grant to study up there. And I thought the distance was a little bit too great to, to, uh, well, to keep the marriage good. So I just found a job in Michigan and went to Michigan and gave up the gig band and other stuff. And then tell me about Jay coming along. Hmm? Tell me. And then uh, <clears throat> Jay well, was born to the Jay's, uh, Jay's born many years later because that, I didn't save the marriage, so I got a divorce, and uh, I took a job as a, as a building principal over in Muskegon, Michigan, and, and I met Jay's mother there, and we got married. And in 1981, he appeared. So what kind of dude was he as a kid? Uh, he, was, he was fascinating. Uh, totally coordinated, riding a two-wheel bike at three, no training wheels. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I bought him a bike with training wheels on it, and I came home from work, and the training wheel was off, and he was riding. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, he's that kind of guy. He was that kind of guy. Do you remember this, Dave? 
<laughs> you remember being three years old and running a mile? Okay. Yep. So, uh, you know, it was fun. And when, um, how old was he when you guys left Michigan? Uh, let's see. Uh, born in, what, 81. Uh, so he had to be about 10. Um, 10, turning 11. Because mom, mom, mom's job ran out in Michigan in, in 91, 92, she got a job in Oklahoma City and I said, hey, go, take the job and, because I'm not going to retire and live anywhere that you have to haul snow. So, uh, I got another year to go and I'll be ready to retire and I'll just come to Oklahoma, so. So she went to Oklahoma and worked out a year, and, and then I needed another year to get my retirement package together correctly. So I stayed back for another year. But I, he and his, he and he and his sister, went out and we bought a house. And uh, so they had housekeeping out there, and I stayed back and made monthly visits, you know. And then I retired and. And I guess when was it, 90, 94? And went out there, and there we were. Did Jay go with them to Oklahoma while you stayed in Michigan? Uh, he did. Uh, the, the, full, the second year, the second full year. Because mom went at, uh, at the end of the semester, and uh, they stayed back with me for that entire half a school year. And then that next summer, we went out and I just couldn't see an apartment. I don't like apartment living. And I don't like giving away my money. So, so we bought a house out there. And so we set up housekeeping and a house out there. And they they managed that until I, until I retired a couple of years later. What brought you guys to Nashville? Uh, I kind of came to Nashville because, again, I was, after retiring, I got divorced again. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was kind of hanging out in Jackson, Tennessee with my blues singing sister. Uh, but when Jay moved over here, I had a I had a son from a previous marriage that we lived here, plus my stepson lived here, and then uh, my son moved to Alabama. Jason transferred here with Dale, and uh, so I decided I'd move over here and be with two of the boys, you know. Plus the fact Nashville has enough nightlife that I can go hear a little music when I get ready. And uh, I first uh, said I was going to sing in the little jazz scenes around here, but then of course uh, the jazz scenes around here don't pay any money, and I would probably I, I drink a little booze and I'll give away a few drinks. See, so mm -hmm. so uh, it wasn't profitable for me to, <laughs> to perform <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'd probably give away or drink up whatever I was going to make. And they don't pay any jazz musicians around here anything. So, so I just decided I'd just sit around and watch. You know, I worked a couple of little venues, and and then I just decided it wasn't worth my time. And then I had back surgery, and they messed up my vocal cord when they had to get a breathing tube in, and so that's the end of that. You ever been to Bourbon Street Blues and Boogie Bar? No. 
Okay, it's in Printer's Alley. It's one of the most popular ones here in Nashville. <coughs> uh, I know the owner. There's a woman named Jackie Wilson who sings there, but that's about the most well-known blues bar in town. Kind of uh, is that the old place that used to be? That, that's not Bootso Place, is it? I don't know. It's in Printer's Alley. Yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, that may be. Uh, that's probably Bootso Place because uh, Boot Randolph I'm talking about. Uh, I remember going there once, and uh, it had been turned over to a, a blues something. Yeah. yeah, that would be it. That would be Bourbon Street Blues and Boogie Bar. I actually know the owner, Bill okay. Martin. So, um, well, let me see if there's a. Um, I think we covered most of it. Uh, I, I kind of went way off the beaten path because just talking to you is so interesting. You know? Hey. I mean, so. You owned a bar at one point, didn't you? Oh, yeah, man. That was the funnest thing in the world. Man, let's talk about that. Okay, I want to hear about this because Jay and I, you know, I told him, I said, man, you know, when we do, I said, make it. When we make it, I said, I want to open up a bar. I said that we both own S&J, Shane and Jay's, S&J. Okay. So you can just hear the sound of it. Let's go to S&J's. Well, you see, I had one that was called. Give me called, some advice here. Uh... If you got time to run it, it's a great thing to do. Okay, now tell me where also. Look, look, just uh, look well, you see. On how it started. I, uh, I've always, I, I was always, I have to be entertained, okay? If I'm going to live anywhere, I have to have some way of entertaining me. And a little music helps. So as I took this job in Muskegon, Michigan, uh, for the first year and a half or two years, come weekends, I just left town because it had nothing in town that I enjoyed. So I just left town and went to Chicago or went to Detroit or went to Toledo or went somewhere every weekend just about. And there was only one little place in town that I found. Well, actually, I had a, a little predominantly black bar in town. But when I went there, most of the parents of the children that I ran in school might show up in there, you know. And sometimes it got a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, so I started going to a little pub downtown, which was called an Irish pub called Visconti's. And there were a lot of professional people. I mean, hung in, you know, the lawyers and the doctors and, and the court appointees and whatever else and the city officials and they, they all stopped in. And we, it was just a nice place, a good conversation place, you know. You could always find people to talk to and it wasn't any, you know, no, 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 no hard stuff going on there. And, uh, after about, and they, and they had little stand-up folk players, guitar players and stuff like that, you know. So we enjoyed that. But after about a year, it was owned by some brothers and sisters. Uh, the brother named Larry, who was responsible. The other bro brothers and sisters who all wanted to live out the cash register. And Larry got tired of covering for him and said, well, I'm just going to close it. So when he closed it, two or three of my friends and I, who used to hang in there, uh, decided, let's buy it. Because it's closed and we don't have any place to go. <laughs> so, uh, they called me, well, actually, they called me up and said, we want to have a meeting, and we need a place where we won't be disturbed. And I said, okay, meet me down at the boat dock, and we'll get on my boat, and we'll go out in the lake, and we can talk out there, and can't nobody hear what we're talking about or anything. So we went and got on the boat, and we went out on the lake, and we, when we got out there, I said, I know what you guys want. And they said, what? I said, you want to buy Vince Curtis. And they said, how did you know? Who told you? And I said, okay. 
Nobody told me. I said, I've been thinking about it myself. So, uh, because we have no place to go, you know? And uh, so we all chipped up, uh, you know, about $15,000 a man, and, and we bought the rights to, to, to do it. You know, we didn't buy the building, but we bought the little business and the license. And, uh, and then we call it just plain, just plain Allen's. <laughs> J.P. Allen's. And, uh, and I say to them, I say, the only one thing I'm going to say, if, if I put any money in it, then I have to have one night that we can play some music that I like. And they say, what's that going to be? I said, some jazz. They said, okay, fine. So we dubbed Sunday night as jazz night. Jazz and Sunday afternoon. We used to run jazz in that little place from from uh, six o'clock to ten o'clock on on Sunday, six to ten. And when we first started doing it, we only we only had about sixty five seats in the little pub. Uh, we had people that would be there at four thirty to get a seat so they could hear the jazz. Well, uh, we ran it for about a year and a half and, and the partners weren't treating it right. So I was the guy who had the most invested and they wanted to sell out to another one of our partners and they discounted the shares and then of course, his dad wouldn't give him his inheritance so he couldn't buy it and then the the deal that they had made for him, I accepted it, and so I bought the pup. Uh, the next year, I bought the building, and then I went into the. It was a. It was a three storefront property. We were only using one storefront, so I opened up the other side and went into the other side that gave me a seating capacity of about 135. And that's where I had fun for a while. And then, I, I mean, I'm going to give you a crazy scenario, bro, because right. it was, it was a, a neat experience. And the combination of people who bought this plug was myself, a black man, Peter Livingston, a black man. Peter Livingston and Peter Satoris bought a fourth of the business together. I supposedly bought a fourth of the business. John Allison supposedly bought, bought a fourth of the business. Cunningham was a little short on his end, so I took up his slack. And Peter and the two Peters were $5,000 short, so I took up their slack. So I had the major investment, okay? Uh, but I didn't have 51%, so I was still, you know, scuffling, and it was a corporation. Uh, so there were three white guys, two black guys, okay? Because I was a school administrator, I did not want to take a leadership role in that because it would involve the liquor licensing and of course working for a school district, they think, eh, they think kind of funny sometimes you in the liquor business. So I, I tried to hide. I hid for the first couple of years. You know, nobody knew I was an owner. Uh, but then when I had to buy out the guys, I was exposed. Now, now the school district uh, approached me with uh, whether or not this was ethical, legal, or whatever else. And I said point blank, well, you know, I have a, when I got called before the Education Committee of the Board, I said, well, uh, you guys are talking about me and the liquor license. I said, but you know, I have several licenses issued by the state of Michigan. I have a driver's license. I have a license to operate my boat. I got a marriage license. I got a fishing license. 
Well, you know, I got a license to be a school administrator. I got a teacher's license. And by the way, I have a liquor license. Now, which license are you going to find me for having? I mean, there's nothing going on unethical at my bar. I said, the records will tell you that there has not been a police call made at this facility since I've owned it. Not one. There's never been any situation with underage drinking or anything. No fights, no brawls, no nothing. You know? So what are you going to tell me? I can't have a business of my own? I don't run it. I hired a manager to run it. So they kind of left me alone. But here's what was really strange. Once it was known that I had bought out everybody, that clientele of doctors, lawyers, city workers, <laughs> which was predominantly white, dissipated. <laughs> so in order to make enough money to stay open, I had to uh, pretty much go to a black bar. <laughs> you know. But uh, I still maintain my jazz on Sundays and stuff like that. And frankly speaking, this is what kind of got me going again because I'd have to go out and find little jazz musicians to play in my pub. And usually I'd get up and sing a number or two here and there. And then I finally hired a group of guys out of Grand Rapids and just gave them the Sunday nights pretty much, at least three Sundays a month. And they played great. And uh, I just started singing with them. And then, uh, cut them down to twice a month, and, and then we work somewhere else the rest of the time. <laughs> so it was fun. So I, I, that kind of got me back into the singing again okay. with that group. But the bar was great. It was fun. Do you have anything that you want to say about Denise, your sister, who, and I mean, you know, she really went like real big as a blues singer. Yeah. So how, uh, how did that happen with her? Well, Denise, uh, like I said, we all started gospel. She used to be in a gospel group in Chicago, a women's gospel group. And, uh, and after a while, uh, she uh, hooked up with a guy, I guess he got married or whatever, Billy the Kid Emerson. And uh, Billy was an organ player, a blues writer, and a performer, whatever else. So he started, you know, writing and she'd be singing around the house with the organ and stuff. And then he started taking her own gigs and stuff. So uh, that's kind of how she got started in the clubs. And uh, then by the time she began to get established as a local artist, they break up. He goes back to Florida. She continues to work in the, in the, in the area. And uh, they had one club that she used to, I think it was called the Black Orchid, where she had a, she used to sponsor, had a talent show thing there where she emceed and oversaw the talent on that, uh, I think it was a Thursday night or something like that. And, uh, and then she married a guy named Bill Jones and he was a chef. Bill Jones, uh, uh, saved his money and they got into uh, recording. Actually, we got him into the rec recording studio kind of down. My ex, my ex brother-in-law, who was a personal friend of Willie Mitchell. Uh, Willie Mitchell had a studio, was Al Green. All those guys came out of that. And a place called High Records, Macklemore in Memphis. Uh, but that's where we used to do the recording, so. And uh, so we got Denise in there, at least Perk got Denise in there. And uh, Denise had, at that time, had herself, a guy by the name of Bill Corday, and a group called The Sequence. So they was gonna try to record an album on all three of these folks in there. 
in two weeks' time. And, uh, and they did. They ran out of money. And uh, I was in Mississippi at the time. So uh, he called me and, <laughs> and uh, I gave him a little help so they could finish up the session. And uh, they offered me half of the project, and I said, no, just pay me my money back, you know, which was the biggest mistake I ever made, because if I had taken half the project, <laughs> I would not have allowed her husband to squander it away. <laughs> but at any rate, she came out of that session with a, a million-seller record on herself, a uh, near-million-seller on Bill Corday, and I think a million seller on the sequence. And uh, so it's been off to the races ever since. Yeah. Well, uh, just one last thing. Uh, let me just check this real quick. <clears throat> It's like I was saying before we began talking, you know, Jay told me, he said, uh, you know, Jay, Jason said, my dad is one of my two biggest heroes in this world, and let's just pretend like he is going to make a living as an artist. What do you want to say to him? Let's say, like, there's no other choice that's what's going to happen with him. What, what are your words of blessing to your son? In terms of making a living as an artist? What are your words of blessing in his endeavors in life? Well, I mean, you know, uh, he's supposed to be, uh, you know, he's one of my creations, and they they get, keep getting better as you, as you go, you know, you know, going that way. So, so he's supposed to be, a, he's a blessed kid, and uh, I don't know if his blessings may not have all come to fruition right now, but but they're going to come. And uh, the only thing I'm, I just want him to be man enough, wise enough that when it comes, I want him to be able to manage. That's all. Because it's going to come. And when it comes, I want him to be able to manage. I don't want him to say, well, if I had you know, if I had only known, uh, you know, I want him to be able to manage it. I think he does. As a matter of fact, when I look at him, a lot of times it's like, I hope to do things the way he does certain things at times. I mean, he's a hard worker. Um, he takes care of his family. He loves his family dearly. And, uh, just good guy all, all around. It's you don't find a lot of rappers who, when you look behind the scenes of their music, they're a husband, they're a father, they love their dad. You know, they live in a low key, family safe place, and that's something that's very unique about them. Yeah, I hope I did something right. I think I did. Yeah, and I just. I just want him to go forward. You know, he and he and Amber are still scuffling. You know, they they have they they disappointed me in one way, and I have to say this <laughs> because neither one of them would get a degree from the university yet. And I spent time, effort, money, whatever else, and they wouldn't get it. There's still time for them to get it. Maybe they will. They'll make it. Maybe they will, but that's 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 my one drawback right there. I, I wanted them to at least have that as a fallback issue, as a. Yeah. But there's still time. Mr. Allen, thank you very much. Hey, it's been my pleasure. I have to tell you, this has been the most amazing interview I've ever done. I don't say that lightly because. The re one of the reasons I say that is because I hardly ever do the interviews. I usually have another journalist do it. 
Mm -hmm. right. But um, I knew that this was going to be special and priceless. And, and I love speaking with people who have come before my time. Uh, I was a student of history when I was in college and I dropped out too. I dropped out and just, I studied history and journalism and then just dropped out and picked up a camera and became a journalist. So. <laughs> it's alright. So. I guess. If you're okay with it. I still I still like the cushion. I, I really love talking to people who came before me. So, so Good. Thank, you, thank you very much. You bet. It's been my pleasure.